Hi, I'm Nick with Thurman Products, and today I'm here with Lemmy, and we're going to talk to you about forced induction. All right, so Nick, we got to start with a, a fairly basic question, right? Why, why is it important to know about forced induction today? Like, why, why, is, why is knowing about this lumpy turbo sitting in front of us, why is that important? Because, like, 80% of vehicles have them now. Everything's got yeah. them now. Quick brief rundown on how a turbo works. It takes the exhaust gases out of the engine that are already being produced using it to spool up the turbo to compress air and enter it into the engine. So many different ways that this happens. I mean, there's vehicles that have really small turbos. They spool up really quick. They don't have as much lag. And then there's uh, bigger turbos that are typically on bigger engines that take a lot more to spool up. They have a lot more lag because they're taking on uh, you know, the duty of spooling this big turbo, but the boost is going to be a lot more and it's going to really set you back in your seat. All right, Nick, let's talk performance of turbos a little bit, right? They're pretty common now. Obviously, people have accepted these things. The performance of a turbo is certainly different today on your economy car than it is on, you know, some of the stuff where these things sort of originated. How we get here? Typically, uh, the racing guys or the street race guys, they really wanted a bigger turbo. They wanted a big, big amount of power Big increase. <laughs> exactly. They weren't really after the small package turbos because it really didn't have as much bang for the buck. They're the ones that can give a little bit of boost where it needs it, but it's typically going to be better on fuel on the normal driving. Yeah, and I think your power delivery matters a lot there too. Those big honking turbos sticking out of the hood, they really do look cool, but you know as well as I do, those things are really at their happiest when that, you know, when that needle's buried, you're bending the tack needle all the way over the side, but that's exactly. not how most people drive on the street. Yep. And that, I think, is the magic of the small turbo, right? They yep. spool up quickly, they provide that little bit of boost, make kind of your pokey car feel a little bit peppier. Do you think that sort of sudden application of power is, is what was maybe holding turbos back from being put into common use? Is it, is it the people in the performance world are selecting these very large turbos that take a, a while to spool up and deliver power? Yeah, depending of? on the application, how they're using it, yes. But obviously, you know, with the new developments in turbochargers, variable vein actuators and things like that, being able to control the amount of airflow going through uh, electronically has made it really easy to use in newer trucks and, and cars. Maybe we should talk a little bit about the maintenance needs that are kind of special to a turbo. Yeah, I agree. Uh, it's super important. Obviously, these turbos are generating a ton of heat. They're cooled by the coolant and the oil. Oil, clearly, when it gets hot, it breaks down. So one of the biggest things is, you know, staying on top of your oil change intervals. You don't really want to let that go like you would on a regular car that's naturally aspirated because your oil is going to be spent by the time you need that oil change. Obviously, oil changes are important on any engine, but it really goes, I mean, double, triple, quadruple for a turbo engine. How fast is this thing spinning? 100,000 RPMs. Yeah, so I mean, obviously lubrication is gonna be important here, but let's talk about some other parts about a modern engine that maybe are independent of the turbo, but are affected and maybe even exacerbated by the turbo. So how about GDI, for yep. instance? Um, you know, so GDI is known to create a lot of soot, which is effectively carbon, right? Yep. So we see that carbon, it mixes in with the oil, which is already kind of bad in and of itself. However, we're also seeing oil weights trending a little thinner, right? Yep. And then this thing, of course, it's it's creating more power for us, but it's also creating blow-by, yep. which means those carbon bits can actually get past your piston rings, and now you've got sort of extra carbon going into your oil. So in my Embedded mind- in your oil. Exactly, and it's just, it's winding up all over the place. How about, um, think about something like cam phasing. Any thoughts on that? Obviously, uh, you know, a small cam phaser seal or, you know, those really tight tolerances, they're, so small. they're not going to like <laughs> anything far in the oil and unfortunately that's what you're going to get how about cooling uh cooling is the same thing i mean obviously these things are getting hot the coolant's running back into the cooling system it's making your engine temps hotter yeah so i've become pretty militant about making sure that i check the coolant in every vehicle for specific gravity and for ph as well it's really important what happens of course if we're running bad coolant through a turbo i mean it's just going to corrode and you know slowly deteriorate the system yeah, absolutely. And ironically, not only does it deteriorate the system, but oftentimes if a leak gets bad quickly, it'll wipe out the very turbo that it's designed to protect, exactly. which is kind of kind of horrible. But I think, you know, it, it's an extra step in complexity in writing the RO for the customer, right? Because you, you really need to do a fair amount of education. These are complex systems, right? Absolutely. I mean, even for us to understand, but for, a, a, you know, a customer who now just sees a huge bill in front of them for a repair, I think it can be both daunting and confusing. How are you dealing with that? When you're trying to sell a job like this to a customer, it could get complex. Obviously, if it's someone who spent the big money on their turbo Porsche, they kind of have an idea of what they're dealing with, right. and they're usually not penny pinching. But you know, the average uh, customer for like a Chevy Cruze that now has a turbocharger trying to explain all those things, 
could get a little uh, a little difficult, but the, the good part about it is a lot of these newer vehicles, they were built with maintenance in mind. So I mean, on, on this cruise, it's probably an hour and a half job to swap out this turbo. And I would be remiss too, if I didn't point out like Dorman's huge line of turbo accessories, you know, and I, I'm, I'm mentioning this just because installing a turbo, everybody just thinks about the turbo itself, right? right? But there's there are like so many other supporting, you know, cast members, so to speak, that yep. have to help support that And if that you're turbo. ordering it from the dealer, it's like 20 part numbers where if you can get someone who has a kit like Dorman, it's definitely a huge uh, time saver. I love that you're mentioning components too. Obviously we're up here to sell stuff, but by the same token, that really is part of doing this job completely, yep. right? So, you know, you mentioned the cruise and I agree with you. That's actually pretty easy, pretty accessible. It's it's not it's not too messy to get in there right. on one of those. But then I think of something like the EcoBoost Ford maybe. Yeah. Oh yeah. Boy, that stuff's packed in there, right? And and come back to that education aspect. I think a lot of EcoBoost owners know that they have a turbo vehicle. What right. I don't think they understand necessarily the packaging constraints in right. there. So, especially if a turbo has gone south, you know, you really have to think about what you're touching while you're in there. You know, you mentioned before things that are breaking while you're taking the system apart. Yep. Things that are just inaccessible, right? So if you got an 8, 10, 12 year old coolant line in there, right? Uh, do you really want to put it back in if it took you a couple yep. hours to get to it? I mean, the complexity of the systems really almost demands that you kind of explain to your customer why you're recommending the things you're recommending. And realistically, I think it's important to let the customer know too, the cheapest you know, the estimate they may get on a turbo replacement may only be cheap because it's incomplete yep. and it, w it may well wind up being a more expensive repair after something has to, you know, something has to be repaired down the line. Exactly, right? super important to ask the service writer for the details on what you're, they're replacing and if they're leaving anything on the table that they might want to, should replace, but aren't doing it to keep the estimate low because, you know, you end up paying for that in the long run doing it twice. Yeah, absolutely. And writers and shop format, I would encourage you to right? Make sure your techs don't get myopic. Make sure that they're looking at all of the possible components they may be damaging or touching that, you know, took a lot of labor to get to when you're putting that estimate together. I think that's really important. Yeah. Well, I think we've kind of gone in and out on these things. We've, we've covered quite a bit of territory today. Yep. Now, of course, you guys are seeing it, turbos come into your base. Tell us what you're seeing and what we're missing. Drop something down there in the comment section below. For Nick, I'm Lem. We're with Dormer Products. We're out of here.